Oh yes, we're back again from Latopia's beachfront summer studio. Hello, it's nice to have you along for the ride today. We've got five very nervous authors at this moment, um, two amazing guests, and who knows, we might discover literary gold. That's what we're trying to do, and this is a submission process that normally takes place behind closed doors, but on pop-up submissions for the first time ever, it's open to everyone. Let's meet our first special guests. Oh, my goodness, it's Kaylee again. How nice to have you back, Kaylee. Thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure. Now, yeah. you're, you're living in Cornwall, UK, mm -hmm. which is where last week's uh, Latipian guest, Dean Baxter, also came from. Coincidence? Yeah. I wonder. Uh, Kaylee, you don't happen to know Dean Baxter by any chance, do you? Uh, yeah, I know him fairly well. He he is my husband. So we're he's your husband. Friends. Yeah, oh. he's got all <laughs> it all suddenly makes sense. Nepotism, yeah. and they told me publishing was free of nepotism. It clearly isn't. Mm. Oh so dear. Bad. Well, mm -hmm. um, it's it's we're into the sort of dog days of summer now. Um, people are looking for something interesting, but not too demanding as a summer read. You got any suggestions? Oh, that is exactly what I've got for you today. So uh -huh. I've, got, I've got Where'd You Go, Bernadette uh, by Maria Semple. There we go. And actually, they say, um, don't judge a book by its cover. But I did a little bit when I went into the shop and saw this <laughs> on the shelf because I thought that looked like a good old read. Um, and it absolutely was. It's kind of a mystery comedy drama about this brilliant but reclusive architect who's also kind of a wife and a mother. Um, yeah. And it's she kind of mysteriously disappears and the story is told by her daughter um, but also kind of a series of transcripts and emails so it's it's very eccentric it's a it's a really interesting read and it, it's quite inspiring in some ways about what you know this kind of multifaceted character who just wants to find a bit of meaning in her own life now, so this is this is this very very good recommendation this is not the first time that we've had a book i think it's last week actually that was largely told like this mm. um and there were not a, not one continuous narrative but letters reports emails and things like yeah. that how easy do you find that to to get into i think it, it's an interesting point i think in this case they did it very well because it gave you it really kind of helped accelerate the story kept the pace up you got to see more perspectives so it wasn't just told from the um from the daughter it was actually bernadette herself and you yeah. get to know her character a little bit and some of her flaws but also some of the things that make her so amazing um, so it's a bit like rummaging through somebody's inbox yeah, exactly. Nice, that. yes, kind of, I get the feeling. Around. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I've ever done, done it. Oh, goodness gracious, what a show this is going to be. It's Michael Jacks. Hello yes, again. Hello. He's one of our most popular guests. 43, I'll say that again, 43 novels under his belt. He knows more about, listen to this, he knows more about the craft of writing that Donald Trump has forgotten about the art of courtly love. Uh, and that's one for our medieval literary scholars and probably about as political as we're going to get today. <laughs> I certainly hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, how are you? What's going on in your particular neck of the woods? Well, my main thing has been spending hours going through this manuscript, huh. which was the very first book I wrote back in 1994. Oh, my and goodness. it was accepted by Bantam Press. Oh, yeah over the phone and rejected three weeks later in writing <laughs> oh welcome to publishing it hasn't changed it's very simple it was all about the ira and the ira had just agreed their first ceasefire so it was out of date <laughs> <laughs> but i'm going through it now because it still works for me so i'm going to be giving a little bit of a, a new start and seeing how it goes that's very good that's actually yeah ridiculous. That's a, that's a good thing for authors to do in general. To I mean, and they don't actually. They don't. They don't think about their backlist at all. It's very sensible to go through your backlist to reclaim whatever rights you can do, and oh, uh, yeah, so. and uh, update them. Uh, you got a book reading recommendation this hot summer's day? This one came as a complete surprise to me, but um, there's a firm down in Newton Abbott called Postscript Books. Oh yeah, and Postscript Books, PS Books on the internet. Um, buy in old stock from publishers and sell it on re reasonably cheaply. I've yeah. been using them for years because they do academic books very reasonably priced. But they had this the other day, The Great Swindle by Pierre Lemaitre. Yeah. And 
it is a fantastic read really is it's rather different in style because it's very much french novel hmm. but pierre lemaitre has been a very successful writer for some time he's a crime writer generally a lot of his books have been brought over to the uk because he was a winner of the prix goncourt some years ago oh, yeah. but this book's all about um the very last days of the first world war there's an attack and the attack shouldn't have gone ahead but the commander wanted to get his moment of glory before the war ended so oh, he sent yes. his troops over yes Two guys are really badly injured. I won't go into the, any of the details, but one of them remains very appallingly injured for the rest of um, the book. And it's really a case of those two characters, how they try to set up new lives using um, different identities, and then how they get enmeshed in this massive swindle over the building of the new cemeteries, which hmm. is caused by the commander who sent him over the top at the beginning. Yes, yes. So it, it's a really fairly convoluted story, the way I've described it, but actually it reads superbly. And although it's not a crime novel per se, because there's no who done it aspect, it's all set out of the at the beginning yeah it's just a brilliant read and i can thoroughly recommend it fantastic two great recommendations they're quite different but from fantastic mm. guests uh yeah i have no hesitation at all in putting my web hand there as well um while you're busy ordering those two books and you've got qr codes there so you've got no excuse at all let's have a look at the very first submission of the day I'm Emma Reed, author of Milton the Mighty and Milton the Megastar. And I'm thrilled to be a guest on pop-up submissions today. And I've got a writing tip for you. This one's about premise. If you're worried if your uh, premise is good enough to become a fully fledged story, see if you can pitch it. Turn it into one or two sentence pitch with uh, the character, the character's goal, what's and what's at stake and if you've got all four of those elements you're probably good to go thank you very much, very much and thank you writing. hope you come back soon our oh, first submission oh yes not fit for purpose mm. women's commercial fiction by avril let me read avril's blurb to you bridget jones meets single white female 30 something Ebony Lockhart hires Mitch Masterson as her personal trainer, but after one fateful night spent together, Ebony begins to imagine there is more to their relationship than just a one-night stand, and enters into a dark world of continuing a relationship with Mitch at any cost. Ooh. Right, so let me tell you about Avril for a start. Um, Avril was born in Dublin 40-odd years ago. They were strange years, were they not? Uh, she's similar to her protagonist, hmm. Ebony, in a number of ways. She worked as a receptionist at TV3, Ireland's first independent television station for a number of years, uh, while also working in a number of background roles, including auto queue operator, floor manager, runner and transmission assistant. <laughs> Well, pretty much running a station there. Um, Avril the Anorak <laughs> appeared on the Phil Corley Saturday show on Today FM delivering entertainment news before taking up her current role as a legal secretary. My word, you've done everything, Avril. Um, Avril also had an epiphany in her late thirties about her weight. And indeed, as Ebony did, she joined a gym and hired a trainer. Oh, here we go. Fiction getting str uh, truth getting stranger than fiction, possibly. It was during her many training sessions that the beginnings of Not Fit for Purpose formed in her head. Avril and Ebony's lives also interweave when it <laughs> this is I don't know, this is getting quite weird actually. Also into interweave when it comes to disastrous dating, and believe it or not, some of Ebony's dates were actually Avril's. <laughs> Fortunately, that is where the similarity between their two lives end. That's what you say, Avril. Uh, Avril's darkness only manifests itself through her writing. Wow. Well, that's a, that's a submission and a half already. You haven't even had it read yet. Tell you what, let's ask Kate to do it. Not Fit for Purpose by Avril. Read by Kate. Prologue. I ran like my life depended on it towards the gym. 
In fact, my life did depend on it. These last few months, I felt like I was going insane. How is it that I'd gotten myself into this situation? I'm a good person. I have always tried to do right by people. I made one mistake, one silly, stupid, ridiculous mistake, and my life collapses around me. There are people in this world who make one fatal mistake after another after another, and it seems to me like they never pay the price. By God, these last few months I have paid the price with plenty of interest. But now, it finally seems that this nightmare is drawing to a close. If we can just talk. If I can just make all of this surreal, insane mess make sense. I feel like I have been raped. Raped of all reason. Raped of all emotion. Raped of all hope. Chapter 1. Her. I pulled back the curtains in my bedroom of my quite unspectacular one-bedroom apartment, looked out onto the busy street below, enveloped in gritty, deadlocked Dublin traffic, and breathed in the start of a brand new day. I had decided that today was going to be the day when I was going to change my life. That infernal biological clock is ticking so loudly in my head that it keeps me awake at night. My mother despairs that I'm yet to make her a grandmother. Ebony, darling, why on earth can't you keep a man? moans Claudette, the woman I have since come to know as my mother for the last 32 years. I can picture her now. For 63 years of age, Claudette Lockhart is a handsome woman. She gets her still flowing blonde hair blow-dried every week and is glamorous to within an inch of her life. Mum is the type of woman who wouldn't dare even open the front door without a full face of makeup. She also constantly reminds me that she can still fit into the clothes that she wore in the 80s, and in actual fact she does still fit and still wears the same clothes that she fit into in the 80s. Claudette Lockhart is no ordinary mother. Clean freak extraordinaire. She's never too far away from the dust buster, sucking up the slightest dropped crumb, and is forever coastering glasses and mugs for fear of watering rings. She never misses an opportunity to comment about my appearance, my weight, my love life, you name it. Not commenting in a good, positive, uplifting way, the way any normal mother should. She will constantly jibe and ridicule me, and will think nothing further of it. Yes, mother, because it's my fault that men are so utterly unreliable and just don't know how to treat a woman, I argue with her in my head. I will not sacrifice my high standards for anyone, even if that means sacrificing my chances of making her a grandmother again. My older brother Joe has two children, so he has already made her proud. I, on the other hand, am a constant letdown. I long to have what Joe has. The quiet life. He goes out to work in the morning. He comes home in the evening. He has his kids. He goes out with his friends for food and drink. He never hesitates. He has the life that I want. This is the conversation I have had with her in my head countless times. I would never dare to actually say it to her out loud. My mother, known to everyone as Claude, currently lives in Spain with her new Latin lover, Alexandro. My mother looked younger than her sixty-odd years, with no hint of life weathering her forehead. Even mum at her age can pull a man, but for some reason I can't. They run a bar. I say they. He runs the bar. She sits at the end of it day in and day out, and she talks to the tourists who come and go. They have quite a vibrant community around them, and some of those tourists visit year after year, and know Claude and Alex very well. She has created a very neat little life for herself, where she has so many friends, but at the same time, she doesn't really have any. These people, who visit her bar year after year, will sometimes spend all night talking to Mum and Alex about their lives, the ins and outs and ups and downs, and Mum listens. Okay, so... Yeah, it's got a, it has got a definite Bridget Jones feel to it, I think, mm. yeah. Um, we've got... Uh, I think we've got a comment there, haven't we, from the author? Yes. 
Avril is actually with us live, which is fabulous. Uh, Avril says, many thanks for discussing Not For For Purpose. I've sent it to some agents who I think it may be suited to. If they say no and I make changes, is it okay to send it to them again? Yes, it is, actually. This is one of the, 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 the great sort of open secrets of publishing. Maybe change the title. Maybe change the first page. But, yeah, bring it off to them after a few months. Not every week. Otherwise, <laughs> that's kind of stalking. But yeah, yeah, you can you can absolutely do that, and you know there's a volume of submissions that goes over agents' desks. Almost certainly, they 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 won't recall it. So definitely keep on going. Let's ask Kylie for her first reactions, please. It's got good voice. It did well to kind of create this dynamic, an immediate dynamic between a mother. Um, the the is it ebony and her yeah. brother so, so that was good um i wasn't keen on the prologue if i'm honest i felt yeah. as soon as it kind of jumped into chapter one that was a stronger opening for me and the whole section around the mother was the most interesting part mm. um it started to tell us a little bit too much yeah i felt that that section evolved but it kind of really go back to those paragraphs where it's it's talking about the mother and the voice that comes through um and i think you know there's some really good bits to pull out there and, and try and keep going with but mm. i wasn't keen on the, i wasn't keen on the prologue and i have to say and this is personal preference you know i saw somebody made a comment when you, you mm. know reference to, to, to the word rape once you've kind of put that yeah. in there it, it yeah. really can be quite jarring and you know if, yes. if it's the right thing to do for the rest of the story great but at that yeah. moment i hadn't really got my bearings with what i was reading yeah um, so just a agree. note there yeah i couldn't agree more actually i thought i thought that was out of place michael Absolutely agree with all of that. Um, to me, didn't read like Bridget Jones, it's read much more black. Hmm. Um, so if this is supposed to be a light-hearted, romantic, thriller-ish type of story, I think she's got the tone wrong. I think that all of the introduction with the prologue, first of all, I think should go. That would only work if it's really going to be quite a black thriller type story. I don't Ooh. think it works at all with it. Yeah. I think the character of her mother comes across as very um, unsympathetic, to say the least. Well, she might be. Uh, and I would, I would prefer <laughs> to see her written more lightly. Um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. the other thing I would say, and I emphasise this every time I have any students, uh, especially if you're doing a submission like this where you've only got a, a few hundred words to get over, it is very important to make sure that all typos are removed and that you've got correct grammatical pagination. So exactly. there were several paragraphs in the one paragraph at the very beginning of that, which really exactly. should have been broken up. Yeah, and that so would true. put a lot of agents off. Yeah, so that's true. That's Avril, true. please break it all up so that it's, it flows more logically as paragraphs. Yeah, great. Okay, I for my uh, part, I I thought I I thought it was a lot good about it. Lots of energy. I I love that when you get energy in a submission. I I like it because that can it can cover a lot of sins really. Um, but yeah, I felt that I, I I the the rape word did very much yeah. jar, and I'm still yeah. thinking about that. And you don't really want me to be thinking about that now. I don't think. Um, and it, as as Michael says, it sort of made it a lot more somber than. Bridget Jones. I mean, if Bridget Jones is a confection, this is black pudding, you know. Um, and I don't know if that's really why you, you, you want us, Avril. Um, nevertheless, nevertheless, I think there's a lot to like about it and lots of potential. Mm. So I'm going to lead the scoring today with three, and I'm going to see what Katie's going to do. I would give it a three as well. You're going to go for three. Um, Michael, who is not, it's fair to say this, Michael, I'm not slandering you. You are not in the natural demographic for this, are you? <laughs> you might it's be. It's not quite my normal demographic. No, no it's no. Um, However, yeah. I'd go three and a half to four because oh. I do like her writing. And yes. It reads really well. The only thing I'm yeah. doubtful about is whether she's in the right genre with this particular story. Yeah. Does yeah, I think that's yeah. So you're you're being generous in terms of potential, really. 
yeah, yeah. okay so we haven't got decimal points here we haven't got round to decimalization <laughs> yet so what are you going to do i'll go for four yeah! I, would, <laughs> I would want to see what else she's going to do with it you're in a good mood to, i happen to know he's been dwell flunking this morning so, <laughs> That's you, want to, <laughs> you, want to, you want to get us some a good good points out of michael it's a good day for that thank you michael <laughs> I'm Brian Clegg. I've just been on pop-up submissions and I've got a writing tip for you. And it's very simple. It's go for a walk, but do it the right way. No music, no looking at your phone, except to make notes. Just let your mind wander through whatever it is you're writing. It's by far the best way to get past blocks and develop new ideas. Do this regularly. I, I used to find having a dog was a great way to force it. But either way, make sure you go for a walk. Yeah, wow. Well revolutionary act these days or it has been actually in this country this is the migrant factor and it's from jeff and it's speculative fiction and that, that white blob down there that you do often see actually when we're giving people's blurbs to you is actually it's, it's space it's room should you so wish to um give us um a web link and what we do is we turn that into a qr code for you no extra cost and um if, if the QR code shows up there, then you can scan that on your phone and you can go to the author's website or their Twitter feed or Facebook page or whatever they want, really. Um, and that's rather nice, I think. So if you do make a submission to us, and why should you not, then send us, send us a, a link we can feature. So this is Jeff's blurb. Justin doesn't feel like a hero. He emerges from a, an abusive childhood, a neurotic loner without purpose, until he meets Sam, a massive artificial human in his 12th lifetime. Sam is a dimensional migrant, a soldier for good, who's seeded by an alien AI program to save Earth from Billy, the nastiest, most brilliant teenager in the multiverse. Billy plans to start a master race after eliminating humanity, ooh, topical touch here, with a super virus. There are three vectors to locate, and time is running out. I love it when time is running out because it gives us meaning and purpose and drama, doesn't it? Let me tell you about uh, Jeff. Jeff lives in Santa Clarita, California, just outside Los Angeles. An affable, he says, this is him describing himself, an affable and approachable introvert. I draw much of my inspiration and inner peace from my frequent hiking adventures in the Santa Monica and San Gabriel mountain ranges. I enjoy a lifelong love affair with the written English language. And I have also been an official science geek since receiving a junior chemistry set for Christmas at the age of eight. Um, I love science and I love writing fiction that teaches while it entertains. Ooh, a little didactic fiction coming up, I think. The result is this book. That's great. And the result today, and it is a re result indeed, is Jeff is going to read it. The first page. The Migrant Factor by Jeff. Read by Jeff. The alley stunk of urine. He wondered why he came this way. Maybe I'll install a moon roof in the tap of your skull, the thug suggested as he shoved the bis end of the pistol into the bottom of Justin's chin. It's amazing how quickly a person can start sweating. Come on, Ted, that's not funny. What's wrong with you, pussy? You look like you're gonna piss yourself. I asked you, got any money today? Justin had grown accustomed to the switchblade back in the eighth grade but Ted already graduated to a new level of terror. The handgun, his most prized possession, was courtesy of a burglary he committed last summer. Ted was a criminal, but he wasn't stupid. He recognised the fear factor of a gun, and this time he was up in the ante. The previous times, Justin was merely shown the weapon, and seeing the Lewington 9 metre was enough to scare him senseless. This time, the muscle threatened to give him a hickey just above his anaplateral. He swallowed hard and found a reserved tank of courage. What are you going to do, Ted? You going to kill me for a girl giving you the money? Well, go for it, big shop. Maybe you would do me a favour. Ted was stunned at the guts' reply. His eyes were crazed and bloodshot. Is that you for a safe? You want to die today? Is that it? Justin was neither as angry as he was frightening. I was saying go ahead. Pull the trigger. Maybe you'd like to be someone's bitch up in San Quentin for the next 20 years. Ted leaned in close. Justin could easily smell the whiskey on his breath. What's wrong with you, Forsyth? You wait until I stick a gun in your face to grow some balls? 
Well, you just fucked up. You crossed the line you should have crossed. So now you're dead. The muzzle pushed hard against Justin's chin. His eyes screwed shut. The dry, metallic click of the firing pin made his heart jump. He couldn't help himself. A high, fearful noise escaped from his lips. Ted laughed hysterically at the prank. Oh yeah, you're really brave. We see a little girl scream you just try to hold back. Ted drove a fist hard into Justin's stomach. Bullseye! Next breath ought to be an audible gasp about 30 seconds from now. Okay, double no is given at this point, but can't look like a dying carp sucking for air. He dropped to one knee and looked up pathetically at his nemesis. It's a good thing I like you for a surf. That's why I'm going to give you a warning this time. You know, I appreciate the friendship we've had over the years. You don't think anything's going to change just because we graduated in a couple of months. You better have some money tomorrow. Or maybe tomorrow I love the clip just for fun. Maybe I scatter all those brains all over the sidewalk. Ted raised the weapon and now Justin was staring straight down the barrel. Even though he knew it wasn't loaded, he could feel his heart race. I got no problem putting you down for his size. You better wash your ass. Ted strode away confidently, leaving Justin searching for some oxygen and some prize. The oxygen came first. Just as he thought, his next breath finally arrived and it was weak and uncertain. At least nobody saw anything. It could have been worse. Yeah, terrific narration there from Jeff. He really got into it, actually, didn't he? The only time I should say. What do you think there, um, Michael? Well, <laughs> I'm quite um, confused by that, I suppose, yeah. is the obvious thing. I thought at the very beginning it was going to be teen fiction, um, it sounded like it at first going through, but then that suddenly changed. Um, I've got to say the enemy of the universe, Billy, the teenager, just walked into my room and peered round the door. So there you go. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's part of the confusion for me. Um, certainly quite compelling start. Uh, I'm a bit confused about where it would be aiming, as I say, yeah. in terms of genre. Yeah. Uh, well, it's called it's called speculative it, fiction, which does yeah, kind of imply, yeah, it but kind the, of implies a slightly older it. audience. But I'm not sure about that, to be honest. I think it I was Kate. Think so. Yeah, Kate in the chat rooms mentioned something like, um, oh. is, "Is it there? Is, is there a comment there now?" I think it really needs to be strongly edited. Yeah, if that's going to use. I, the I think is you're right. You can't get any feel for the way the story is going to go from that particular beginning. Yeah. That's what, I was looking for it, Kate, so just about to scroll off the top there. Altered Carbon, as told by the Beano, which is, I think, <laughs> quite a good take on that. But who knows? It might have been just the thing to float your boat, Kaylee. I quite enjoyed it. I did yeah. write um, synopsis. Whoa. It was quite, there was a lot going on in that synopsis um, yeah. to kind of then move into this opening chapter. Um, I, again, I think it needs an edit. I got a little bit confused about the point of view, who was talking and who was kind of, yeah. what was going on a little bit. Having said that, I thought it had a lot of energy, it had a lot of pace, and I did like the dialogue. I thought that was done really well, uh, really helped by the uh, the voiceover for sure. Um, I, I yeah. actually really enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, Jeff had a lot of fun with that, actually. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say I, I don't love the title. But that's no, I don't. True. I don't. No, I was I was going to mention that actually. I think especially in this day and age with the you know, current political yeah. situation and background, so yeah. I think I don't think it's, it's even it, it doesn't work in any in any way, and it's only got negative associations actually. Mm. Um, yeah, I was rather wondering what we were going to see actually mm. initially with that title. So yeah. lose the title, Jeff. Um, Kaylee, your honour. On a roll here. How many points? Um, I am going to stick at three for this okay. one as well. Okay. I wonder, is it going to be one of those shows where everybody gives three to everything all the time? I don't know. <laughs> I haven't. It's poss well, <laughs> you haven't. That's true. That's true. But in so many ways, Michael, you are an exception. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so what are you going to give this then? I can't go higher than two. Yeah. It, it didn't work. I knew, I knew you were going to say that. Um, <laughs> I, uh, yes, I'm. I'm probably going to do the same. Actually, I want to. I want to give more because 
there's a lot that I want to like about it. So I don't Ooh. want to like the title. But uh, again, I like the attack, you know, I like that. But, you know, as people are fond of saying to me when I get carried away on my own enthusiasm, you've just got to judge the words in front of you. And the words in front of you, I'm not going to get too, too crazy about at this moment. I'll tell you what we should do, though. I've been very remiss. Let's have a good scoreboard. Um, now, this is not complete, OK, because the chat room vote for what you've seen is just being calculated even now oh look huh wasn't well, that wonderful you saw it move in front of your eyes yes it is real it's not just a complete fix um so not fit for purpose is actually off to a fairly good start there avril you may be happily surprised by the end result today we don't know but you may be um this is Av this is avril Oh no, it's 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 not everyone's Martin making another comment. I got confused. We've got comments coming in left, right, and centre. Um, so yeah, sixty-five percent of the score you've got to beat. Let's see if the next submission will do that. Hi, my name's Sarah Grant, and I'm the author of many books for children and teen, including the Chasing Danger series, an action adventure series for middle grade readers. My tip for you is to remove any filtering from your manuscript. Um, it's really easy to do, and it's one of those things that separates your readers from the action. So I have a handy-dandy old-fashioned screen chart. So look at words like this. See, touch, feel, hear, see, notice, think, know, and realize. Those words are often needed and can be used, but scrutinize every time you use those words. Um, because what they do is they filter that action through the narrator. So for example, you might say, the plane's wake seemed to rock the boat. Doesn't need, we don't need to say seem to. The plane's wake rocked the boat. I felt myself being catapulted into the air. No, I was catapulted into the air. And sometimes I think those are just little ticks that we all have. But again, scrutinize those words, remove filtering, and really make your prose a lot more powerful. Happy reading and happy writing. Thank you very much, Sarah. Our third submission for today comes from Warren, and there is a QR code there. And it's historical fiction. And this is Warren's blurb. In the spring of 1984, I received a missive that would have a profound impact on the next seven years of my life. An acceptance letter from the State University of New York at Albany. The Albany years, 1984 to 1991, chronicles my chaotic, hypnotic, psychotic, and downright neurotic <laughs> years while studying and living in Albany, New York. The novel is a blend of distant memories, meaningful experiences, and pure contrivance. Well, that sounds quite tempting, doesn't it? Let me tell you about uh, Warren. Um, I'm an actuary by profession, but I'm looking to pursue my passion as a fiction writer. I recently had three chapters from the Albany Years published in the March-April 2020 issue of Contingencies magazine. Congratulations on that. And further congratulations will be due, I'm sure, for Georgina's rendering. The first page. The Albany Years, 1984 to 1991, by Warren, read by Georgina. Ventured through the century, the changing tapestry from bowery to reverie along the streets of Albany. Such sinister surreal, Washington Park arboreal, soul exploiting aureole, corporate and corporeal. Smiling steps forebode marble forest portico, brownstone downtown, cheapest rent around. Chapter, The Drinking Contest. Foie gras, foie gras, foie gras. One of those words, two really, that if you say enough times loses all meaning. Foie gras, foie gras, foie gras. Karen and I used to spend afternoons in the freshman dorm at SUNY Albany, skipping class, getting high and working this mind bender in reverse, creating made up words that had no meaning on organically working them into conversation. Deroit. It wasn't until the street vendor unhooked his belt and started singing Rainbow Connection with strained Kermit, Kermit affectation that my deroit gland started to flutter all a tremble, or tremble all a flutter. Glapiate. I came, I saw, I glapiate. Don't you mean glapiated? Karen offered with a shit-eating grin. Uh, no, I corrected her. Glapiate is like the verb red. The past and present tense are spelled the same. 
collar odor, that fugue of cologne and body odor you encounter when walking through any IT department anywhere in the world. His collar deodor preceded his entrance into my office by a good 20 seconds. These journeys were usually good for a full 15 minutes of gasping for breath laughing, followed by a bong hit and 15 more minutes of pee in your pants laughing. Good times. Of course, the real challenge was to use the word in an outside setting and see if you could get away with it without quizzical looks or outright, what the fuck are you talking about? Like this one time at Dan's Diner on Central Avenue, when I asked the waitress if she could point me towards the alicus, I stood up and cross, sort of crossed my legs to indicate it was a bolneal thing, but never actually said the word bathroom. Second door on your left, and off she ran to collect the bill at table five. My guess is she never even heard me. Like my dog Bonzo, she simply read the body language and didn't need to understand what was coming out of my face, but I still took full credit for triggerizing her. Dan's Diner was a special place, an oasis for the drunken nomad. Even their hours catered to the nocturnal, from 4 p.m. to 6 a.m. Dan's, better known as Dirty Dan's, was owned and operated by Dan O Something, a legendary and iconic mainstay of Albany's bar scene. He had to be in his 70s, tall, lanky to the point of anorexic, mean and nasty, but with avuncular overtones, a full head and face of wild, unkempt gray hair. Think aqualung, usually with a few braids running through his beard that terminated with colorful beads. Dan was always there and always cooking, in seven years, I never saw anyone else man the grill. And boy, could he wield a spatula, a regular Picasso of the pancake flipper, an Einstein of the egg inverter, a Hendrix of hash slinging. Despite a well-stocked menu of mostly breakfast fare, I always ordered the same thing. Eggs over easy, hash browns, cider bacon and rye toast. No matter how busy the restaurant was, five minutes is all it would take to receive a meal fit for a king. Four wonderfully runny, brown on the edges eggs sitting atop a heap of hash browns, crunchy on the outside, marshmallow soft on the inside, and strewn here and there with more bacon than anyone would reasonably think is safe to consume in a single sitting. Dan's is the only place on the planet, I reckon, where you will hear the phrase, whoa, that's too much bacon. Even the rye toast was not to be believed, four frisbee-sized slabs slathered in butter. This four egg frisbee toast hill of hash browns half pound of bacon tour de force was a standard serving. You didn't have to special order for all this craziness. You just ordered a number four and voila, and all for seven bucks. Before you went out for the evening, you made sure you stashed $10 in your sock, not to be touched for any other purchase than a number four plus tip. Okay, thank you. Um, and we've got some chat going on public. This is the public chat, actually. We've got two different types of chat here. We've got the Topia chat, which you see constantly on the screen. And we've got the public chat on YouTube. And you see Avril's having a little conversation there, which is rather nice. Um, and if you are chatting away in public there, don't forget. Yes, there's a little man down on the right hand side of the screen with a Hawaiian shirt on saying you can buy a super sticker for any price you name, actually. Um, I quite enjoyed that, but I got a slight reservation about it, which I think I think this is snuck in because it is autobiography, isn't it? Isn't it, Warren? Really? Truly? This is autobiography and you've called it historical fiction. So I'm not so sure about that. Let's see what Michael thinks. It ain't historical fiction. No, <laughs> it's not. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of people have a lot of debates about um, the Historical Novel Society, for example, argued for some time what historical meant, and they came up with at least 50 years before the birth of the author. There so you go. There that's you one go. possible route. However, um, I quite like his writing. It, it gets me, again, um, no pagination in effect. You've got yeah. one massive long screed of text with no break. Mm. Um, and it makes it very hard on the eyes, and I wish mm. more aspiring authors would have mm. Um, just present any nicely. dialogue yeah. for example needs to be broken out yeah. uh, don't just leave it all within there interesting I mean, it's my sort of period um, I was a student actually so I've got he, you? You know, he's ticking the right boxes for me wow um, but they, what do they say I about actuaries can't... Michael isn't it isn't it actuaries you... of people who find insurance a bit too exciting Accountancy too exciting oh, sorry, is the normal yeah. definition, yeah. <laughs> Luckily, I was too exciting to pass any exams. But um, the difficulty he's got is 
if you're going to write something which is this personal and based on your own life experiences, yeah. you have to be pretty famous or have some yeah. extraordinary experiences to make anybody sit up and listen. Yeah. Um, I think he would do far better to move it away from his own uh, personal experiences and aim more at inventing a novel based on other characters. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because you, I can't you, tell where this is going to go. I mean, from the synopsis yeah. and everything else, there's really no no meat to give you any impression about what sort of book this is going to be. Yeah, that's right. It's got to be pretty extraordinary. I mean, I started out, I don't know why, but I started out thinking of um, oh, um, Augustine um, Burroughs, wasn't it? Uh, running with Scissors. Um, but, you mm. know, I mean, his life was just extraordinary in any case. So. Yes. I, I don't I, know I'm not the, convinced the life of no. an actuary is going to fulfil that requirement. <laughs> That's a quote for the show, that is. That's our show title, I think. <laughs> yeah. I think the um, the thing is, I, I quite enjoyed reading it, and I think yeah. everybody needs to do some writing like this at one point in their lives, actually. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. it is a way to sort of to dig in more into and to, to understand yourself and to start to, you know, hone the... Which is great... Yeah. But in that case, with the submission, you must have a synopsis that tells you what the direction of travel is going to be and what yeah. the punch at the end of it is going to be. You exactly. can't have a synopsis that she's just completely open like this. Exactly. Exactly. So, points. I'm fearing the worst here. <gasps> <laughs> oh, I, I can't go higher than two, I'm afraid. No. no, I knew you were going to say that. Let's see what Kaylee's going to say. Um, yeah, I, I agree with what's been said. I actually felt like uh, it needed to be flipped as well. So when it opened up talking about Dan's diner, I was like, oh, could this be a better opening? Um, and it just had a little bit more, um, I don't know, it just seemed like that was a better place to start. Um, another note on this, I felt like, and I know it's been picked up in the, in the chat room, trying to be a little bit too clever with language pair it back there were so many words in there and so many descriptive words and, and trying to you know um i think just tone it down a little bit might might serve it better um yeah. in terms of scoring shall i go for it i think you should i would, no, I, I would give it a two yeah i think we're all going to go for twos but it's not one it's not one one yeah oh. we're, we're all we're all doing the two thing on this um and I'm just I, I would just say again it is a nice bit of writing yeah and exactly that's right well. I, I yeah. totally agree that um, the uh, he was getting far too clever with too many yeah. self-indulgent yeah. sections on words at the very beginning the diner would have been a far better start point yeah but then I, without knowing what the synopsis is about Christ knows <laughs> yeah <way>. exactly <laughs> Um, that's all right, it's the dwarf looking. Um, I, <laughs> I, uh, I can't see this as commercial. That's the thing. No. And, you know, from my end of the, the spectrum, Warren, um, I've, 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 I can only, you know, I'm trying to make money out of this. I'm trying to make money for you. I'm trying to make money for, for me. If, if you make money, I make money too. And every yeah. submission has got to be seen through that lens. Um, so, I th you know, it sounds like you've got a very interesting background. You've got a fluency there as well. But background doesn't necessarily have to be completely regurgitated day by day, month by month. Um, it's, it's the sort of thing you absorb and chew over and creatively process and combine with who knows what else to produce something that is truly original and special. And then that <laughs> might, might stand a chance of being commercial. I would just add one thing, and the guy who really did very well at using all of his experience in offices around the world was Peter Mayle. And of perhaps yeah. Warren ought to consider looking at yeah. some of Peter Mayle's writings yeah. um, and then yeah. seeing if, how he could incorporate his own experiences into that style. Very good advice. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. This is Ros Morris. I'm the author of Not Quite Lost, Travels Without a Sense of Direction. My writing tip for you today is to check any facts you put in your book, because someone will know if you fudged something or got it wrong, and they will write to you about it, or they will tell your friends that you don't know a thing. So check any facts. Thank you, Ros. Uh, by popular demand, we... Um we re-engage with with Michael. We want to know what's going on for you, Michael, because you are, in many ways, I think I think you're a sort of, I don't know, a father figure. 
you're a sort of a, a shining example of the independent author who is still doing it, who produces, what did we work out last time we spoke about? Two books a year, isn't that? Yeah, that's normal one. Yeah, yeah. This is the good. <laughs> isn't it? How, how many? Only one and a half? Um, it's actually one, but... Uh, okay. Yeah, it, it, like a lot of other authors, I've found the whole of the being locked indoors and the virus affecting everyone has been really very badly distracting possibly been. less distracting yes. than having a wife at home and having my daughter at home and having my oh, son at home full time yeah yeah i hope they're not watching my beer intake's gone up though well yeah well who, who hasn't actually dear idea um so let's just focus on on the genre that you've you've managed to kind of invent for yourself actually um yeah. let's have a look let's have a look at this this latest offering it's, having said that it's not actually your very latest book at all tell us about it no it's not it's a reissue of an excellent book that everybody ought to buy especially <laughs> around christmas time you shameless um, self-publicist you <laughs> well one tries yeah so <laughs> tell, the what's, what's the history of this book this is interesting so canelo press are a fabulous new company yeah who do brilliant covers as you can see the yeah. boy bishops club is a new well you've got cover, two really nice covers there actually one of them is the older one and this one on one the left of them the, the is big the one. one with the boy yes and that is far far better for my way of thinking um the other style was the simon and schuster style and they tried to have everything with one character and yeah. they had a lot of action scenes and they didn't fit in with with what is basically a crime series yeah but yeah. i'm very happy with the canelo books i'm trying to get um, these guys on the show actually they're very interesting publishers put a word in one. because i i keep on emailing i can't remember the guy's name uh, the managing director is a very nice guy Craig. yeah i think i think i think that's his name um I, he, he says oh i'm a bit shy no come on you can you Come on and just tell us what you're doing. So it's a fairly new publisher doing interesting things. Yeah. We want we want them on the show. We want to hear what the, what they're doing. Now you've well, also created. One, Sorry, go on. Sorry. No, I was going to say there's another publisher I can almost guarantee I can get on for you, and that's Richard Foreman of Sharp Books, who also has my modern books, Act of Vengeance, <sighs> and my trilogy on the Hundred Years' War, and. I think it's that for now, and a couple of collections of short stories. But uh, See, he, he Michael's career spans about, every oh, publisher, turn. every aspect of publishing. It's extraordinary. Well, this man, this man is a living fossil, I ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I've even so been by Harper Collins in the states. Wow, that was amazing. <laughs> so. What is you're like the coelacanth, really? Uh, <laughs> so what? <laughs> this is literally coelacanth. I'm getting carried away. I'm getting carried away now. <laughs> so what you've done, and this is this is the interesting, but I want you really to talk about what you've yeah. done is create a sort of a little sub genre within a bigger genre that really is is your readership. Um, mm. And I I was struggling before the show just to tr try and find words to describe it. Um, I can't yeah. easily. It's sort of. It's a bit medieval, isn't it? It's a bit Templars. It's not exactly sword and sorcery. I mean, how would you how would you position uh, your books? I say they're modern day thrillers set in the Middle Ages. Oh, okay. Because there I think that's the easiest Simple. way of describing them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I've got a dog just moved out from underneath my desk. Which <laughs> right, we love pets. Me. We have um, a lot of pets on this show. I've I've basically got two main characters. I've always loved. Um, stories about medieval England yeah. and so I invented two characters one of whom was politically very astute who had seen the world who had seen lots of different deaths in various styles so he was a knight templar he'd been to war he'd, he'd met the pope he'd been all over the world wonderful yeah. but the yeah. templars had been disbanded he was a deeply religious man because the templars were but he had no faith in politics or in the church because they had both um destroyed his life yeah. and then the thing was i thought he'd be a brilliant investigator for a crime series huh um if i brought him back to devon that would be an ideal place and then i thought he would be the worst crime investigator in the area reason <laughs> being he'd been uh, abroad uh, all the damn time he wouldn't know uh, the local people local customs the local rules or anything else so i had to go and do some research and i found this guy called stephen puttock who was a thatcherite in the early 1300s he was a serf when he was born so he was a a slave, effectively owned by the Bishop of Ely, 
Um, and over the course of his life, he built up a portfolio of houses that he was renting out. He had two sheep pounds. He had his own flocks of sheep. He had it, it was a fat tribe. It was ideal. Huh. And the Bishop of Ely was delighted because he took 10% of everything. Wow. I thought, right, that's the trap. I've got a bailiff now called Simon yeah. Puttock. Fantastic. And that was the, okay, you can that was see. the beginning of the series. But you can see no how much enthusiasm no Michael's nonsense. got for his subject, can't you? And I just think <laughs> I think you're a, you're a wonderful example, actually, of an author whose whose passion has is just paid off. You know, you've, you've you know the material inside out. You know your demographic. You know your readership. You know what they like, and you enjoy doing it. And I mean, yep. you, know, you can't ask for better than that. Actually, fabulous, brilliant. And I can't say how, how important that last one is for mm. aspiring writers. Yeah. Enjoy what you're doing. Do yeah. not write to try to write for a specific market or a specific person. Yeah. Write to satisfy yourself because yeah. then it won't be work. It'll be enjoyment. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Brilliant. Absolutely. Thank always, you, always <laughs> amazing value for money when Michael comes on the show. Cause particularly, we don't actually pay him. So um, let's have a look. Uh, you'll get a, <laughs> you'll get an invoice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now. A little more work to do before we talk about invoices, Michael. Um, mm. Let's have a look at our, our fourth submission of the day. Interesting title. This is from Edward. It's science fiction. And it's called The Spectral Soldier. And it's the shortest blurb, I think, today. It's quite simply this. One man's mission to use time travel to uncover a centuries-old conspiracy with allies and enemies from across the history of the world. Wow, there's vaunting ambition for you. Let me tell you about uh, Edward. I'm a 23-year-old law student currently living in Atlanta, Georgia. I've been fortunate enough to travel the world, including places like Japan, Italy, Israel, and Hong Kong. I am passionate about reading, writing, public speaking, sports, and creative stories and experiences, whether through television, movies, or video games. Um, a big, a great interest in the big questions of life. I believe a work of art, this is interesting, is a reflection of the author's soul, intentionally or otherwise. And I believe The Spectral Soldier, my debut novel, has something meaningful and entertaining to say about me and the world. Very nice. Very profound, I think, actually, uh, Edward. So we'll do the very best we can, which means going to call for Ali. The first page. The Spectral Soldier by Edward, read by Alison. It has been either decades or centuries since I began my journey, depending on your perspective. It began with a lie. When I was 12 years old, my mother begged and pleaded with me to join her and my little brother in visiting the tomb of the unknown soldier. She said my father's spirit was buried there, but I knew better. I knew the trip was a shameless mockery of the men whose spirits deserved to be honoured there. Still, I went. When I close my eyes, I can almost feel the blistering July weather that made the soles of my shoes stick to the concrete sidewalks. The blazing heat was only secondary to my real dread, the lie that started everything. My father had abandoned our family years before, leaving my mother to care for two young boys amidst the Great Depression. It broke her. To her dying day, she insisted that my father had died in the Great War, his body lost to the conflict. My mother believed more fervently in the goodness of my father than anything. I never saw a shred of evidence to prove he was the man she swore he was. No letters ever came to our door, nor were any tags ever returned to us. We got no condolences on my father's passing, except for the pitying looks people gave my mother when they saw her walking with the sun clinging to each hand. My little brother, barely nine when we visited the tomb, accepted my mother's tale willingly. To me, the fabrications were just another mark against my father's legacy, the incredible lies that had to be told to twist his character into something redeemable. The trip was everything I feared and worse, but for one thing, the monument. Everything about the structure was imprinted on my mind in the years following that visit. I still remember the impact of the sentinel's shoes on the perimeter, the very air a testament to the sacred spirit of the tomb. I took time to carefully memorise the words engraved on the western side of the glistening marble structure. Here rests in honoured glory an American soldier known but to God. Just one man was laid to rest in the tomb when it was first built. 
that even that one withered, decayed corpse could be a powerful symbol. He represented all those who were lost and could not be identified. Collectively, they are called the unknowns. Though I was only a child at the time of that visit, my mother bought me a tiny engraved cigarette lighter afterward, perhaps hoping to salvage a trip she knew I resented. Her grief was so immense that she might not have realised how inappropriate the gift was for a child. The inscription on the small metal square became illegible over time, but I cherished the present nonetheless. I was too poor to smoke, could barely even open the lighter without burning my fingers, but I held it close to me all my life. Many years have passed since that visit. When I look upon the tomb now, the engraved words on the monument resemble those indecipherable marks upon my lighter. The sentinels have long since deserted the grounds. The air is barely fit to breathe. The monument is defenceless. There will be sentinels again someday, I tell myself. The monument will be restored, and visitors, like the child who dreaded every moment without realising how precious that journey was, will read those words again. Someday. Nostalgia should not have this effect on me, considering all the history I've lived and touched. But after I willingly immersed myself in the carnage of a thousand battlefields, is it any surprise that I'm drawn to a mausoleum like this? I think heavily on those the tomb represents. It is easy to imagine myself inside that grim vault, another nameless spectre with an unknown past and an empty future. The only thing that separates me from those dead men is the unassailable fact that I am not dead. I should start from the beginning. My name is Thomas Faber. I still remember the day I was supposed to die. Okay, so that's starting from the beginning. Got some great comments in the chat room. I think we're going to come to Kaylee in a moment. Let's just see. Um, yeah, so Andy said something. Let's just scroll up, I think. Yeah, lots of backstories, says Andy. I'm getting some decent writing in the character, though. I'm just not sure he's very sympathetic. And Cora says, too much of a detour here. Where's the story? Probably starting those last two sentences, actually, oh. and Cora. Um, spending too much time inside his head, says Hannah. Great hook at the end, says Andy, uh, just confirming what I suspected. Kate says that should be the opening line. Right. You're on the hot seat, Kaylee. Yeah, I agree. As I was kind of going through I said that the first I wrote down that I felt the first line should be the trip was everything I feared and worse but actually when it got yeah. to that last line that should yeah. go right up to the top yeah then I think it should the kind of bit about the mother buying him the cigarette lighter I quite liked I thought it it showed like us a that. lot about her rather than kind of telling us too much about the father I yeah. found that whole passage too, too long too much of a detour oh, no. for an opening not pacey enough that could have come pages in um so some nice nuggets there and i think there's you know lots of rich material but it felt too slow for me for the opening yeah. for what it should have been i know it did a bit didn't it actually and ali couldn't fight against that i don't think uh points please um two from me oh, but it could be yes. it could be a lot i think there's some really good stuff there so with a work through i think that could it could be you know a, a lot better it could move up yes but you've got to judge yeah. what uh, what you see you've got to judge the words in front of you uh, michael well i must admit when i read the synopsis i thought oh it's doctor who um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely it is yeah of course i have to admit i really liked it I okay. thought the writing was very good. Yeah. I thought it was, it, it did grab me and it did pull me into the story. I loved, I actually disagree with you. I, I think, yes, okay, you could easily have that, um, uh, my name is and ending in die. I forgot, I didn't make a note of the whole thing. But that would make a re really good for, uh, I actually found that that, introduction pulled me into the story more than i was expecting from the synopsis okay. much much more and then that just made i made me really want to carry on reading it um okay so no i i really enjoyed that i like good that. I thought good. Was good. I thought this is this really is what we want if it was very very good indeed fantastic well that's very that's very good news and how many points definitely four <sighs> interesting um i did feel uh, on balance i have to say i do feel it still was a prologue for me um i think mm. that i'm going to sit in, in between the two of you actually 
<laughs> going to go with three. So, yes, uh, 23 years old, actually. Edward has the whole of his writing life in front of him, doesn't he, Michael? I would say he really has a good potential future. I think his yeah. writing is very good. Um, I don't know if he's taken that to a professional editor or anything, but I think that was really superb. Good. Excellent. Well, I, I, I love hearing that. That's fantastic. Let's see. Current state of play on the scoreboard. 65% not fit for purpose. 50% migrant factor. 40% Albany years. Spectral soldier. Hasn't finished scoring yet. Oh, ooh, yes, it has six. Oh, just under just under <gasps> if only i'd given it one more but we do have a, this moment at the end of the show which is rapidly approaching when our guests can change one of their scores up or down i don't know what's going to be do you hi this is ros morris i'm the author of not quite lost travels without a sense of direction my writing tip for you today is to check any facts you put in your book because someone will know if you fudged something or got it wrong and they'll write to you about it or they'll tell your friends that you don't know a thing. So check any facts. Oh, yes, absolutely. And again and again and again. This is our last submission of the day. It's YA Fantasy. It's from Brian. And yes, we do have a QR code there. So please scan it with your mobile phone and go straight off to whatever weird corner of the internet um, Brian wants you to go to. We don't check. It could be anywhere. I mean, it could be some ghastly site that, you know... Oh, it wouldn't be. Of course it wouldn't be. Brian wouldn't do that to us. It's called Anorock, which is not some dodgy Mike Oldfield album. I'm sure it's not. It's... Well, I'll tell you what it is. This is the blurb. Anorock is made up of three regions. Plains, mountains, and wetlands. For centuries, chiggities... I like saying that. I want to say that again. For centuries, chiggities have coexisted on this mythical planet in peace and prosperity, rarely venturing out of their natural territory. However, with a rapidly growing population, critical resources have become sparse, particularly the most valuable commodity of all, painite. I like it. Ah. Chiggities have always been separated by those who work for Unios, and those who do not. Unios proudly provides all the necessary P. And there you have been truncated, Brian, I'm afraid. There is a little box underneath that counts down the number of um, characters. So we don't know what it provides, but it begins with a P. I'll tell you about Brian. Um, very, very short and succinct blurb here. Founder of uh, Kuderna Financial Team, author of Millennium, Millennial Millionaire. Why do I find that so hard to say? Millennial millionaire. Got to do a lot of smiling for that. Mo uh, host of the Kuderna podcast, news contributor. Okay, that's great. So, it's a young adult. It's fantasy. It can only be one reader. Robert. The first page. Anna Rock by Brian. Read by Robert. Prologue. We shared a bunk bed with improvised mattresses made of twigs. My little brother, Dak, always got the top because he thought it was cool to be floating up in the air. The real reason was because he was scared of someone breaking in, as if the elevation added some security. That, or I would be expected to fend off the bad guys. Everyone knew each other on our block. I don't know why he expected some chiggity to smash in the door and come and kidnap us or something. Even though he was approaching high school, he'd often roll over in the middle of the night and look down at the bottom of our bedroom door for a sliver of candlelight from the hallway. If it was there, Dax had a good chance of falling back to sleep, knowing that Mama was still awake and moving around the house. However, if there was no light shining through, it usually provoked a sleepless night for Dak, in which he'd ask me if I was awake every twenty minutes. I tried to pretend I was asleep and couldn't hear him but the boy was relentless. Tonight, Dak slept soundly with a melodic snore, a muffled inhale followed by the softest whistle. A cool breeze blew through the window, just enough to remind us winter was coming. Mama's white nightgown brushed against the wood floor as she crept into our room. She scooched onto the edge of my bed with her feet dangling off the side. I propped myself up against my headboard and surveyed the room in preparation for a lecture about what happened today. A poster of Chiggadees gliding 
hang gliding through the mountains adorned the wall by my bed. They each had shiny golden fur, silk white robes, and flying goggles over their blue eyes. I never went hang gliding, but it was a popular hobby for affluent chickadees in the wetlands, and the thrill of soaring through the air held a certain appeal over me. Across the bedroom, which was only about two feet more feet, stood my dresser, covered in marble kits, a dirty robe, and a few random pictures of our family. Mama stood back up and reached for a small frame with a headshot of my father in his work uniform. She plopped back down at the foot of my bed and stared at the picture. You're old enough to know now, Beaker. I didn't know anything about my father other than this portrait I always overlooked. The story about Uncle Dobo leaving him to get yelled at by Grandpa and his connection to the strange artefact over the front door. Your dad would have been proud of you today. He always believed in you standing up for yourself. Maybe I wasn't getting a lecture. This is the last picture I have of him. He was 25 years old. Papa was a member of Unius, a proud wearer of the red robe. I sat up in disbelief at Mama's words. I never noticed from the black and white photo. The rhetoric amongst my relatives always suggested a disdain for the over-entitled red robes versus us independent white robes. She explained how Papa worked in the mines every day. This was back when Unius served a larger purpose, just trying to keep its members alive day to day, forget about fair wages. Papa was famous for goading Uncle Dobo and his cronies into all-night arguments about economics and the necessity for the working men of Unios, Mama continued. She said he held steadfast his opinions, but was always fair-minded and had no problem calling a red robe and a white robe his best friends. After ten years on the job, Papa had grown tired of the drudgery of slaving away deep below Anorok's surface. His spirited debates defeated defending red robes had transitioned into an attitude of resignation. He supposedly hated the confines of Unios, never being able to make a decision or add his thoughts, but rather serve as a cog in a machine supporting the leadership and their dogmatic chums. He wanted out. I always asked your dad not to rock the boat, that he could complain to me here in our hut, but not be so loud with his friends. Mama whispered as she peeked up at Dak. Okay, so uh, a couple of things there. First of all, um, Brian, you did send us the whole manuscript, which is a bit of a nuisance, really, because he does leave it up to us where to cut. And Robert did the very best he could under the circumstances there, as we always do. Um, but he is helpful if you actually just send us just just what, you know, that tailor-made, just the bit that you want to, want us to show on the, on the programme. And the second thing is a challenge to what I always call, as you know, the genius room, because it is entirely populated by geniuses. And that is something that um, I haven't seen them say anything about yet, but it's the name of this submission, Anrock, A-N-O-R-O-C. And the challenge to you, genius room, should you choose to accept it, is what is that an anagram for? Or have I gone completely barking mad? I don't think so. Nope. I, I bet you're going to tell us any moment. If you know Michael, just keep I'm keeping sh quiet. Keep I stum for a moment because <laughs> I think I, I, it's a challenge for the uh, for the chat room. Uh, let's go to Kaylee first. First reactions. I'm not going to comment on the title. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like this writer knows this world that he has created very well, but he's not drawing us into it for us to have the same interest. So he's talking about the red and white robes, and I still don't really understand the, the significance or, the, or what that really means. It all still feels a little bit too far away, a little bit abstract. Um, there's some nice writing in there, and I think that there is there is definitely a premise there. I would be careful of the dialogue as well. So the first, I think, it was the first line the, um, the mother said just felt a little bit unnatural, and it was almost kind of put in there to, to suddenly move the story on, so yeah. they could start talking about this world and the father, and, and that didn't feel very fluid to me. Um, I also pulled out, and it seems quite picky but just two words like scooched and plopped i did i didn't feel like that naturally sat within the tone of the story so just a bit of a watch out on that i felt a little bit jarring got it got it okay mm. so the the totality of your view in numbers from one to five is going to be um 
Oh, I've just seen the chat room. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a little distracting, isn't it? <laughs> um, oh, I feel like there is there is some good stuff there. I just think it needs a good edit and a little bit more colour putting into this this fantasy world. So I'm going to pitch it at a two, but it could quite easily be... An encouraging two there from Kaylee. Yeah, all right, understood. Michael, they got it, didn't they? Mm. Yeah. I, it did nothing for me at all, I'm afraid. It's, okay. um, it's one of the... The writing was quite good. Um, I, I would just uh, emphasise your words about when there is something like this, when you're asked for submissions, read the rules, stick to the rules. Mm. Because... Mm. Mm. especially with things like competitions when i used to run them for the crime writers association we would get people who tried to ignore any number of rules and it just meant that they had a far lesser chance of getting on it does um, and it's a nuisance for the people who are you know usually giving their time yeah. for free to just to run things yeah it, it, it doesn't make life easy for anyone no, no. certainly not for the author uh, he has some nice writing uh, i wouldn't argue with that but I didn't feel as though I was pulled into the story at all, um, possibly because I'm not a young adult or fantasy type reader, uh, right. so okay. perhaps I'm just in the wrong field, but yes. um, for the quality of the writing, I would say two, two. Uh, I wouldn't go higher. Okay, a two there. Um, I'm probably going to have to agree with that, but... I know, I know. I'm probably going to have to agree, but I do like chickadees. They do. It's a lovely word. I just give um, that very large American actor from the 1930s who called everyone his little chickadees. <laughs> W.C. Fields, but I think Johnny got there in the That's chat room first, actually. Yes, W.C. Fields. Absolutely. I like children, but I couldn't eat a whole one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they never get old, do they? They never get old. Um, okay, I'll tell you what we should do now, I think. While the final tally is being tallied, um, we should have a look and see how things worked out last week. And this is what we saw last week. This is this week. Thank you. <laughs> this is this is my, oh, the all over the place. This is what we saw last week. So Sophia gave us the accidental daddy. Shelby gave us Rody. Shane gave us oh you mighty. Giles gave us ascension, and Dennis gave us a very deadly sin. And the ending of the show, well, it wasn't quite acrimonious. We didn't quite come to blows, but we didn't agree. Dean. You have the opportunity, should you wish to take it, to change your vote on any one of those submissions. What are you going to do? Are you going to twist or are you going to hold? I'm going to hold. You're going to hold? I'm going to hold. Fair enough. Good. I like a man who stands by his vote. But Roz, now you've seen all the submissions, you too have the opportunity to change Make it bigger, make it smaller. One vote on one submission. What you're going to do? Can I give Rody another five all over again? No! <laughs> 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 That's breaking the rules. Only I can do that. Yeah, so uh, it was it was Rody actually, by eventually by a country mile. But that was not the end of the story. What happened was that in the few days since then, six days actually, if, you, if you're if you counting, people exercised their right to vote at litopia.com slash vote, and vote they did, and this was who won. Yeah, big upset. Big upset, actually. Oh, ye mighty from shame. It kind of muscled its way in there. Well done, well done, Shane, absolutely. It muscled its way in. It was muscular writing. It was aggressive. It was all over the place, really, but it had lots of energy. And I spotted it, and nobody else did. At least that's the story I'm going to tell my grandchildren. Um, yeah, so an interesting upset now. We come back to today's vote. And this is how things stand. Before before we give our two panelists the chance to change their vote, and you can see that it started out strong with not fit for purpose from Avril, 
who hopefully is still with us actually she's live in, in the youtube um chat room yeah she is many thanks for the tip she says and encouragement guys all great help lots of food for thought and we aim to do that avril that's exactly what we aim to do thank you avril gave us that the migrant factor came from jeff the albany years which is historical fiction no it wasn't historical it was autobiography from warren the spectral soldier from edward only 23 years old we thought he uh, he's got a bright future we did an anorak johnny got that quick as a flash he got the anagram from brian now then gonna ask you kylie there are your scores three for not fit for purpose three for the migrant factor two for the albany years two for spectral soldier two for anorak do you want to change any one of those votes yes i will actually okay but i think i was making a little bit um Oh, you're going to give it a three yeah, yeah. Okay. we've just done that for you it's gone up michael you have a chance to twist or hold what you're going to do i think i'll hold i'm more than really happy with that lot fine understood so this is where we stand at the end of everything today. It's a tie. Would you believe that? It's a tie. We've got not fit for purpose from um, Avril. He's got 65%. Just shuffling my papers madly here. And the spectral soldier from Edward. Tied. 65%. So I guess it's up to you, isn't it, really, to, uh, to sort this out? This is where you do it. Pressing all the wrong buttons, folks, but what the heck. Litopia.com slash vote is where you go to help us resolve this, this almighty deadlock we've got ourselves into between Edward and Avril. I don't know, who knows? You may totally agree. You may say that they deserve to be the, the joint winners. I don't know. But I'm excited to find out, and we will find out same time next week after you voted there. It's been an interesting show. We've had two fabulous guests, Michael and Kaylee. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel and Kate, for all your work behind the scenes. Rachel's just gone to bed, actually. I happen to know. She's in New Zealand and she's entitled to. Thank you for everyone who sends us the submission. We're here to help and support you guys. We're not here to tear you apart. No Simon Cowell's on this show. It's hard enough already being a writer. I tell you what, why don't we do it all again same time next week. Take care. Cares and worries, careless words, trying to drive a wedge between us. Lonely mornings, secret codes. I just gave up keeping this cold. Slander of liars Nothing can stop us, baby This is a time Can't hear the pounding inside I'm coming for you at the speed of Show